After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. I wonder what he saw. I wonder what it would be like to be there. Just let our faith change to sight and the blessings of heaven become a reality to us all. Now that's a promise. That's something we have to look forward to. You know, the Bible talks about three different heavens. It wasn't specified which one I'd talk about. Maybe I'd like to talk about all of them. The first heaven is where the birds fly. The Bible often speaks of the fowls of the air. And sometimes the word heaven is used. Genesis 7 verse 23. This morning from Psalms 8 verse 7 and 8. The beast of the field, the fowls of the air. The fishes of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. So we think about heaven, we think about the first one being where the birds fly. But there's another one. We'll call it the second heaven. And that heaven is where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. The Bible very often talks about this. In the creation recorded in Genesis, the first chapter. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In verse 8, and God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So we think about a heaven where the birds fly. We think about heaven where the sun, the moon, and the stars are. Genesis 1 verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven." To divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be a, for lights in the firmament in the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. In Psalms 19 verse 1, a very familiar verse to us all. The heavens declare thy glory and the firmament show thy handiwork. So we know quite a bit about heaven number one. And we know a lot about heaven number two. You know, just in the last few years, in the lifetime of many of us, men have able to venture out into this heaven. Men have traveled to the moon. They've gone into outer space. And they've learned many, many things about this second heaven. But another heaven that we read about in Isaiah 66 verse 1, and I suppose that's the one that we're interested in today, the Apostle Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. I'm sorry, in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and beginning uh, with verse number 1. If you have your Bible with you there today, it will be easy for you to turn and just notice some of the things uh, that are recorded. 2 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up into the third heaven. Now if there's a third heaven of necessity, there must be heavens one and two, and those are the ones that we have just discussed. How that he was caught up into paradise, and that was mentioned this morning, and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. 
But now forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth to be in me, and that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now this particular verse has been discussed by people for a long time, and they've asked, what is the thorn in the flesh? What was given him to buffet him, lest he should be exalted above measure? I believe that Paul talks about himself. Probably this was the time when he was stoned at Lystra and drug out of the city and left for dead. He said, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. The time frame is right. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. I take this to mean that he didn't know if he was dead or alive. We were taught this morning about the separation of the body and the spirit. He said, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up into the third heaven. You know, we have something similar probably in the story of the man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves that stripped him of his raiment and left him half dead. Now, it'd be interesting to know how a person could be half dead, wouldn't it? And I think that simply means that he was unconscious. And I think Paul is talking about the same thing here. He didn't know if he was unconscious, if he was dead, if this is a vision or if this is something that was real. He said, whether in the body or out of the body, I couldn't tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up into the third heaven and heard things which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Now, I'm going to drop something on you here this afternoon. I want you to think about it as you read and study your Bible at home. Suppose you had the opportunity to have described to you the wonderful city of God that we call heaven and then tell you not to tell us so. What do you think that would do to you? He heard things unlawful for a man to utter. He wasn't allowed to tell. He couldn't tell. He wasn't allowed to tell. He couldn't tell. I think that might be a thorn in the flesh for you and me. Have you ever, I'm sure some of you ladies have had people tell you something and, and it was really, really a good piece of gossip and then they said, now don't you tell anybody. And you said, boy, I wanted to tell that so bad I could taste it. And you know, I think we would be the same way if someone could describe heaven to us and then if they told us not to tell anybody. Sometimes the passage in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, is used to describe heaven. 1 Corinthians, uh, the second chapter, verse 7 through 10. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen or ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And often I hear this passage used to describe heaven, and really, really I think the description might be fair and good, but the application is not the direct application of the teaching. You know, what happens here, Paul refers to a prophecy that was made uh, by the prophet Isaiah. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered the heart of man, the things the Lord hath prepared for them that love him. But he went on to say, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So now these things are revealed, the application was, the coming of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And it's true and the application good, especially in so much uh, that the gospel teaches us about the great things of heaven that we all can enjoy. But see, here was an economy that was coming, a spiritual economy that people just couldn't imagine. And the blessings that are provided uh, through the gospel of Jesus Christ are things beyond uh, uh, comprehension of, of man's imagination. So that's what Paul referred to, but at the same time, there are other passages that would teach us that heaven is just like that. I don't know how you feel about heaven. I do know that John saw, and I do know that Paul heard. So we wouldn't say that I had not seen, nor hear heard. But now, later on, these things were revealed, and we have a lot of information about the city of heaven. I don't know how you feel about heaven. To me, heaven is very real. You know what Garland said a while ago? Hell is real. I have a better subject than he had. And I want to tell you that heaven is very real. I plan to be there. I plan to enjoy the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. I want to be a part of the city of God. I want to enjoy the blessings that he has provided for us and call them in many different ways. There are a lot of descriptions about heaven. You know, songwriters and publishers have for a long time captured the thoughts and the imaginations of a lot of people and in their songs, they have written about heaven. We sing the song, When We All Get to Heaven. Now, I have a little pet peeve about some of the books that have changed the wording of this song. And it says, when they all get to heaven. And I'm singing it with a pronoun of the third person like it belonged to somebody else. And I don't usually like to sing the song that way. Well, I, I'm sure there were reasons why they did that, and some of these publishers are very cunning and crafty, and sometimes they have to change some words and do some things, maybe to get around copyright laws. I don't know. But I don't feel like when we sing the song, when we all get to heaven, that that belongs to someone else. I want to sing it with the understanding that I will be a part of that group. And we'll be able to sing and shout the victory. Where the roses never fade. Where the soul never dies. Where we'll never grow old. Are you beginning to get the picture? Wonderful city of God. Won't it be wonderful there? That beautiful home, the Christian's welcome home, the heart shall reap in joy, the glory port, the prettiest flowers. Oh, think of the home over there, looking for a city. Life will be sweeter someday in the home of the soul. I'll meet you in the morning. I'll fly away. If we never meet again this side of heaven, I will meet you on that beautiful shore. How beautiful heaven must be. An empty mansion. I don't know how many of you have heard Brother Pat Manon lead this song. An empty mansion. He led a good song last night and did a good job. Pat isn't noted among the brotherhood as being a song leader as some of the other brethren are and those who teach rudiments of music and help us all improve our singing. But I love to hear Pat lead this song because when he begins to sing, 
Here I labor and toil as I look for a home. Just an humble abode among men. But in heaven a mansion is waiting for me. And a gentle voice pleading, come in. Now if you heard Pat lead that song, you know that it's real to Pat. Now see what's happened in our songwriters See how they have described for you and me. And you know, if you don't believe these things about heaven, you need to quit singing these songs. Because when we sing, we need to sing with the Spirit and with the understanding. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, that we've heard today already. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. This is a description of heaven. In John 14, verses 1 to 4, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't be disturbed. Don't be upset. Don't be restless. Never doubt. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Do you want to be there? Do you look forward to being there? In Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12, it's styled as a reward. We understand something about rewards. Certain awards and rewards are given in this world for certain accomplishments. But Jesus said, Blessed are you, and men shall revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Do you think it's worth it? Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. You know, it's a terrible thing when men persecute and revile. And they tell things about us that are not the truth. Sometimes these are hard to take. It's hard to understand why people do that. But often people get disturbed and they get discouraged and sometimes they give up on the faith of the gospel. But Jesus said, rejoice and be exceeding glad. Be happy that you can... Suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. Why? Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Paul along this line in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 34 and 35, For he had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. You know, don't ever doubt. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The apostle said, we walk by faith and not by sight. One translation said uh, that it is, uh, when we talk about our faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is the confidence of things hoped for, the assurance of things not seen. So Paul said in verse 37, uh, not to cast away our uh, confidence and let our faith be shaken and destroy us uh, of the great reward that we have been promised to receive. He called it a better and an enduring substance. You know, some of these descriptions are hard for us to understand because we deal with things uh, that are not enduring. We deal with things that do not last. You know, Jesus said, Matthew 10, verse 28, Fear not them which can destroy the body, but cannot harm the soul, but rather fear him which can destroy both soul and body in hell. You see, we're used to dealing with things that are destructive, he said, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. 
You know, Paul talked to Timothy about <clears throat> teaching people that were rich in this world not to have confidence in those riches. He said not to trust in uncertain riches because, you know, they can be here today and they can be gone tomorrow. But trust in the living God who giveth richly all things uh, for us to enjoy. So when we began to think about heaven, it is enduring. It is a reward. It is a mansion. It is a place of beauty and of joy and of peace and of happiness. Things that are the things that we enjoy most in this world, but here they do not last. But in heaven they will be styled as an enduring substance. This city of heaven sometimes is referred to as an inheritance. People are familiar with inheritances of this life. And you know, sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're very substantial. But as being a child of God, we have an inheritance. It's an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now an inheritance that you might receive in this life is an inheritance that is subject to decay. It is corruptible. It can be defiled. And it may soon pass away. You know, I know of some people in our area that people have talked about, they received their part of an inheritance and then right away it was gone. But this inheritance is not like that. It's an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. I don't know what your application, personally, the book of Revelation is. There are many. And I think it certainly had a direct application at the time it was written to a certain situation and a certain people. But you know the book of Revelation is filled with signs and symbols and parables and prophecy and revelation, metaphors, parables. And you know very often a parable is used, something that people are familiar with and laid alongside great truths that the Lord wishes to teach and they're able to understand them better. Sometimes prophecy has a dual fulfillment. Sometimes there may be dual applications, just like fleshly Israel and spiritual Israel. And I think there are some things in the book of Revelation that you need to take a careful look if you're interested in knowing what heaven is like. After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. You know, that just really intrigues me every time I read that. And most of you know I use it all. Sometimes you may be waiting in a doctor's office. You may be waiting in a place of business. There may be something taking place in another room. And you may be seated to where you can... You can see the door, but you don't really know what's going on in there. But you've seen enough to know that whatever's going on in there, you'd like to see more. Your curiosity has risen to a very high level. And you just keep watching that door. And after a while, that door comes open a little, and then maybe a little more, and, and you know, you just stretch. See if you can just see what's inside. Every time I read this verse, in Revelation 4, verse 1, I think about that. And I would like so much, I would stretch my neck to its limits just to be able to look in there and see. And I want to encourage you to read what John saw. As you go throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, very often you're going to see this expression. 
and I saw, and I saw. Now you're going to read about some things that he saw that wasn't too pretty. Garland's talked about some of those. But you're going to hear described some of the most beautiful scenes that you could ever imagine. And there's no need for me to stand here and read all those for you today. I'll give you something to do tonight. But I like this. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there'll be no more sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. You know, these are some of the things that plague us most. Sorrow, disappointment, heartache, grief, crying. There won't be any of those things because the former things are passed away. Some of the brethren were telling me that a few years ago we had a meeting over at Beaumont and they told me what I talked about and they told me how I described those. I didn't remember all those things. It sounded really good when I heard them talk about it. But you know we're enjoying such wonderful association here today. Is that what heaven will be like? Well, we'd like to think so, wouldn't we? But really it isn't, because, you know, this is going to end in just a little while. Heaven won't be like that at all. In just a little while, some of you are going to be saying goodbye. We won't ever have to say goodbye there. Some of you as families have met here. And you're going to tell your children and your grandchildren goodbye. And that's tough, isn't it? Heaven won't be like that. There won't be any more goodbyes. And then some of you are going to cry. Especially the girls. And some of you young men, it won't hurt you to cry either. Some of you have made such good friends over the years, many of them, at these meetings. And sometimes about the only time we get to see some of you is at the area meeting. What a joy. What a blessing. But then we have to say goodbye and we cry. Not anything wrong with that. Jesus is our example. And he wept. But heaven won't be like that. Because there's no sorrow. Nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. You know what brought about all these things? Sin. Separation from God. We used to sing a song. Sin will never enter there. Wouldn't it be great to live in a place where there was no sin? Now, I don't want to have so Gerald Ray's talk. I thought he did a good job. But I do want to tell you that heaven is prepared for those that prepare for heaven. Preparation is necessary. I might style it like this, by reservation only. Now some of you are staying in some of the hotels and motels in this area, and you call the heads several months, several weeks, several days, and made reservation. Some called and there were no reservations available. That was sad, wasn't it? And I want to impress you and leave you with this thought that heaven is by reservation only. 
The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 1, verse 4, to an inheritance that is incorruptible and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. How do I make my reservation? Remember, sin cannot enter there. Or nothing that defiles. Nothing that will take away from the blessings and the joys of heaven forever and forevermore. So you need to be free from sin. You need to get rid of your sins. We've been separated from God because of sin. You need reconciliation. And you need to be made friends again with God. Paul said to wit that God was in the world in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. You need to accept Jesus Christ. And through obedience to his gospel, your sins can be washed away in the blood of Jesus. John said, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's the way that you make reservations. You then can become a child of God and then you have right to the inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away. Some of you may have done that and then for some reason just walked away from the best thing that you ever had and that was Jesus and the hope of heaven. But see, there's still time. You go back and read the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3 and many of the warnings that were given to those people, maybe for an altogether different, uh, different reason and for a different situation that was going to come upon them. But they all had an opportunity to repent. There was still time. And that's one of the great blessings and hopes of the gospel today. There is still time. And that time is now. So you can come back to him. And you can have your reservation renewed for heaven. Heaven is a place where our inheritance will never spoil nor be spoiled. The joy will never diminish and it will last forever. I couldn't imagine a person in this assembly today that would not want to go to heaven. I couldn't imagine a person in the state of Texas today Relax. I'm not going to do you fellas what some of them did to us. Can you imagine a person in the state of Texas that would not want heaven as a reward? Not just in Texas. In our nation. Not just in our nation, but in every nation of the earth. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever would save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If you're away from God today, is it worth it? I just can't think of any way that you could be having enough fun in sin to think it's worth it. So, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. May God bless you and help you in making your reservation for this city of God. And I plan to meet you there. The Lord bless you.